You truly have gone mad! I am not mad! You're sinister. The deadliest X-Men villain is a crazy genius. Marvel's Dr. Nathaniel was a genius beyond doubt. He was a regular family man who was passionate about the science of evolution and the future possibility of the existence of mutants. A very regular biologist indeed. Okay, maybe not so regular. But only one of those things drove him to his crazy madman label though, and there are no brownie points for guessing that correctly. But that realization dawns upon the reader only when Dr. Nathaniel openly admits to not mind becoming a monster for science's progress. The family he had, a wife pregnant with his second child, a first child he had lost, all of these took a bat seat. Our villain here decided that nothing except science, not bound by moral turpitudes, was worth his attention. That attitude was very much welcomed by another supervillain, the mutant apocalypse, who was figuratively a present topped with a nice red ribbon for Dr. Nathaniel research purposes. It was enough of a lure for Essence, who eventually underwent genetic mutation at Apocalypse's hands and became Mr. Sinister. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Come on. Sinister, from a scientist to a dangerous mutant, a Victorian scientist regarded as a genius like no other, Dr. Nathaniel, born in England sometime during the 19th century. He was an ardent follower of Darwin, and his ideas included making mutants someday in the future. Essence's fascination with science was to such an extent that he kept all his feelings and morals aside and dug up his four-year-old dead son Adam's body to experiment upon. Mark Silvestri and Chris Claremont seemed to have no filters regarding gruesome details and that made for quite the dark backstory. The horrific extents that he went to to prove his thought process to the Royal Society were so morally corrupt that it caused his membership to be at risk. At one of their lectures, he attempted to shed light on evolution and how fast it could go if science and humans were to explore and utilize their true potential. Dramatically as he had planned to, he unveiled a monstrous creature made during one of his botched experiments entirely composed of human and animal organs put together. The other people present there were rightfully disturbed by the sight and banished him from the society right after. Needless to say, Dr. Nathaniel sat no rights. He had no plans of stopping his work and research on essence factors that would establish the existence of mutants in the future he envisioned. Running headfirst into trouble with the marauders right after, he managed to get acquainted with the weird criminals, who in return kept Essence's supply of organs, etc., going steady. In an unprecedented move, the marauders caused the wake of an immortal mutant called En Saban Nur. Noor met Essence and revealed to him that Essence's theory of existing mutants was now evidence. Noor had powers that made him the mutant apocalypse. Being one of the world's first of his kind, he was special and very interested in Essence's work, which he conveyed to Essence at Hellfire Club, a mutant terrorist group. Ironically enough, the last time Essence had approached the Hellfire group was to fund his research. On one instance, Jean Grey, aka Phoenix and Scott Summers as Cyclops, met Essence and Apocalypse as travelers from the future. This confrontation was the result of Madame sanctity of the clan Ascony, sending the Phoenix and Cyclops to stop Apocalypse from being born and growing into having the destructive powers they knew he would come to have as he arose. Mildly stated, Essence was fascinated with the time-traveling couple, but Apocalypse was a power-hungry madman and he placed the two of them in captivity. Essence was reminded of his wife Rebecca back home, who he had left pregnant with their second child when he went on his adventures with Apocalypse. He attempted to make a return into their lives, but by then, Rebecca had found out about Essence digging up the body of their dead first child, and she was disgusted to her core. Rebecca set free all of Essence's captives before he got back home and denied him any modicum of forgiveness. She died in front of Essence's eyes, prematurely birthing their second child and making sure Essence knew she did not think any good of him. Rebecca's last words to Essence were gut-wrenching, but deserved by Essence, no doubt. She called him utterly and contemptibly sinister. Devastated and maddened further by her words and the overall situation, Essence returned to Noor and was quite complacent as Apocalypse transformed him into his prelate. The process of celestial technology was painful and made Dr. Essence a pale, unfading monster. Urged by Apocalypse to embrace his new identity and leave the past where it belonged, Behind him, Essence took on the last thing his otherwise loving wife called him Sinister, and made that his name. As Mr. Sinister, he voluntarily let whatever humanity remained in him to be chiseled out, leaving him with objective clarity, but no morality. No! They're my friends! 
for Sinister, the first impactful comic book appearance. Nathaniel as Mr. Sinister had an origin story, revealed in and traced through a four-part miniseries, The Further Adventures of Cyclops and Phoenix. The cover itself features the man in all his glory, and a bold declaration of his origin beginning here. Now we'll look at issue 221 of Uncanny X-Men for his first full appearance and one of his best ones in print at that. The issue opens with Mr. Sinister admonishing the Marauders over their failure to kill Madeline Pryor, a clone of Jean Grey. Madeline was created by Mr. Sinister himself to act as a mutant he could control so that he could overthrow Apocalypse, but now she needed to be erased from all records. Madeline had survived the Marauders' assassination attempts and was recovering in the San Francisco Memorial Hospital. After making his displeasure clear, Sinister put together Arclight, Harpoon, Polaris, Sabretooth, Scalp Hunter, Scrambler, and Vertigo to form a team and sent them off to ensure Madeline's death, implying clearly that another failed attempt would go down worse for them. The team seemed quite obedient and who wouldn't be, especially after seeing Sabretooth's sorry attempt to attack his master, Sinister, then getting thrown aside like an insect spotted in water. Meanwhile, in the danger room at the School for Gifted Youngsters, headed by Professor X, Dazzler was refining her skills through training against the hologram of Rogue. Rogue did not take to that kindly as she believed Dazzler was not seeing her beyond her ugly past. As they were arguing it out, there occurred a telepathic intervention from Psylocke. Psylocke informed them of Wolverine's call of emergency and that the X-Men needed to gather at Memorial Hospital immediately. It turned out that a terrified Alvar Woods Madeline Pryor had given them a call for help. She was deeply upset about the attack on her, and that it probably wiped out her identity altogether, and her family was nowhere to be found. Meanwhile, Wolverine had already been informed of the marauders hanging around and about the hospital. Logan mentioned this to his team, telling him that it would not come as a surprise if the marauders try attacking Madeline again, as they had the first time. He was additionally convinced when Betsy said that the two marauders were perhaps already in close vicinity of Madeline. At that, the X-Men sprung into immediate action and Rogue went in first. It clearly wasn't Sabretooth's day, it seemed. Because for the second time in the course of this comet's plot arc, the monstrous devil was taken over, this second time by Rogue. Rogue finally reached Madeline's room, only to find Scalp Hunter's gun pointed straight at her, about to take her out. Rogue's arrival distracted Scalp Hunter, though, and as soon as he turned his gun to Rogue instead, Madeline pulled off the brave act of smashing Scalp Hunter's head with the food tray kept nearby. Scalp Hunter only got angrier, attempting to follow her as she tried to escape, but he was rendered immobile by Dazzler's laser blast from a whole street across. As Madeline, supported by Psylocke and Longshot, reached the rooftop of the hospital in a final bid to escape, the trio was met with the lights of Vertigo. Having been disoriented, Longshot jumped off the roof with the other two women in a desperate attempt to save their lives. His power of luck worked as they landed softly on the back of a truck. Here though, tragedy struck in the form of Harpoon, whose energy weapon struck Psylocke. The pain from that experience was felt by all other X-Men too, especially the ones still in the hospital building fighting against the Marauders. Havoc and Wolverine were seen together here, completely disoriented by pain. Scramble took advantage of that and made Havoc go all out of control, causing structural damage to the hospital building. He was only stunned by the force of these events, but Scrambler assumed him dead and only pushed Havoc down a hole in the floor to end him too, for once and for all. A few more thrilling panels and lots of action later, the escape story begins. Wolverine, having been put out of a stunned state, met Rogue and asked her to make an immediate escape from the area with Madeline in tow. They obeyed immediately and, on their journey, Rogue realized that she was just as clueless as Madeline was about why the Marauders wanted to make Madeline their victim. Before they could have too many thoughts on the issue, they were subjected to an attack by Polaris. Polaris managed to bind the two escapees to exposed beams made of steel laying around on a construction site sitting in deep foundation, ripped those beams out, and with the two of them tied, propelled the whole thing into the waters of the San Francisco Bay. Dazzler was our hero here, as she not only managed to use Longshot's hook to grab them and save them from drowning, she also made sure that Rogue would be safe even after Madeline swam to her freedom. Given their previous altercations, Rogue did not believe in Dazzler's feelings towards her being friendly in any way, let alone kind or heroic enough to risk saving her life at the risk of Dazzler herself drowning. Right at that moment of a dawn of realization, if you will, Polaris came in on one scene and this time around, she had no plans of missing her delightfully difficult to kill Target's death in her hands. I have watched you, tracked you, studied you. You are the prototypes 
<laughs> Sinister in X-Men the Animated Series In Series 2 of X-Men the Animated Series, Nathaniel Essex appeared as a recurring villain in his well-known form of Mr. Sinister. The part continued for pretty much the rest of the series. An apostate scientist obsessively researching on genes and genetic mutation and to bend nature to serve his evil ways. His background is slightly altered here. He remained a believer of Darwin's theories but but his reasoning and aim of research were different. I'm around, he was trying to attain godhood for his wife Rebecca Gray and himself by way of advanced evolution as Rebecca was terminally ill. He managed to make a serum that empowered him with regenerative abilities. While the entire town thought he had lost his mind in the pressure of the impending loss of his wife, he fled the place. His pale white but significantly more powerful self took on the name Mr. Sinister continuing to look for colleagues who would support and embolden as he tried to create the ideal evolved world. Voiced by Christopher Britton, his presence was quite remarkable and important for the plot. In his final show of the series, his ultimate aim was shown as defeating Felix, which he achieved. Following that, he disappeared into an alley as dark as his character arc and is acceptably never seen again. As my gift to the world, the mutant powers of all combined in each. Mr. Sinister, what makes him so powerful? Before anything else, one must know that Mr. Sinister is an alpha level mutant, one of the most powerful of his kind. Alter at the genome level, Mr. Sinister largely owes his wide selection of powers to Apocalypse's experiments on him. That aside, he of course obtained, forcefully and otherwise, genetic material from other mutants and allowed himself to have more advanced powers like teleportation. Sinister can heal from injuries as serious as gunshots or stabs quite fast, regenerating damaged tissue and muscle at a pace quicker than his opponents. Thus, his high stamina and strength comes as no surprise. Being able to control every fiber of his being gives Sinister the unique ability to morph into anyone or anything, since he can shapeshift at the cellular level. That means he can be any animal, human, machine, or weapon he chooses to be. He is incredibly fast too, and can fly at very high speeds as well, force fill, and is capable of telekinesis too. Sinister has quick reflexes, allowing him to often dodge lethal attacks. He can read minds and project his own thoughts onto others as well, while he himself is resistant to it. Creating memories in people's heads, erasing old ones, manipulating them, Sinister can do all of it and he only needs the being to be in his presence. With his hands, eyes, or even the diamond-shaped red mark on his forehead, he can fire force blasts of destructive nature. Away from my friends! Mr. Sinister closing in. Over the years of loving and appreciating the presence of villains in the world of comics, be it in print media or the cinematic universe, Mr. Sinister has come to be appreciated for his evil genius and dedication to making life hard for our superheroes. It is not an easy business to write a character art impactful enough to not take away a superhero's glory, but to still have it be etched in the minds of people. Mr. Sinister was and remains a geneticist with incredible brain power, which he is due to be given credit for gene manipulation, and to study it deeply enough to achieve it successfully and be able to incorporate it into your devious plans in such a way that it wouldn't be frowned upon as simply incredible. His one desire was to break free from Apocalypse's control over him. To achieve that, he met and manipulated a number of reps of the mutant race. The results, Madeline Pryor, Nathan Summers, who were incredibly, who were incredible characters on their own with the downright impressive independent stories. When Krakoa was founded by Professor X, Mr. Sinister was made a member of the government there, aside from, of course, being given citizenship. To serve his personal interests, he had his mutant group labeled Hellions. The Krakoa Resurrection Protocols were a direct conclusion of Sinister's work on the classification of all mutant genomes. In the world of movies, Fox's X-Men probably wanted Mr. Sinister to be the next big villain out there, but before that dream could materialize into more, Disney bought Fox. A clear fan favorite, Mr. Sinister is that villain you want to watch out for. A part of several historical events in the X-Men franchise when it comes to comics, fans are rightfully hungry for more of him on the silver screen. Marvel, psst, make it happen. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone. Magneto, while you can.